died have been returning to life. back to Obsolete Automotive. I'm Austin. If you haven't subscribed, hit the button down below. First thing I'll talk about today is this 1972 Dodge Coronet Custom. This car came by way of Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes, obvious by the license plate. But before that, it came from Wisconsin. You see there's an old Wisconsin inspection sticker, as well as several Wisconsin park stickers. I guess maybe that was to be able to get into various parks. Uh, one of them does say senior patron passport. So I'm guessing whoever had this car was obviously older. And I just realized there's a, there's a dime right there. Nineteen sixty seven vintage. That's probably been there a while. And I never noticed it till just now. Anyways, you always find cool things in old cars. I don't know anything about the previous owner of this car. There's no owner documentation in the glove box. There's no old registrations. All that was scrubbed. Uh, there might be something under the back seat. I haven't pulled that out yet. Sometimes you can find some good treasures under there. So I'll do that later at some point. The coolest part about this car is what's under the hood. Check it out. Behold, 225 cubic inch slant six you just don't really see these too often in mid-size or full-size cars and the interesting part is the 225 slant six and the 318 v8 were actually both standard engine options you could get either or it didn't cost more or less so pretty much really had to decide to get a six cylinder in order to get one it might be for ease of maintenance it might be for better fuel economy um, hard to say or maybe someone just preferred having a six cylinder in some ways it is easier to work on there's more space around but it's interesting that this one has it more of the cars that had six cylinders were pretty much like government or fleet vehicles um, this one for all i can tell is not one uh, but as you can see there's not a whole lot going on under the hood there's not a whole lot of options on this car so there's no air conditioning there is power steering um, but that's about it there is what is the remnants of a cruise control system down here. I don't know if they never actually installed it or it was partially installed and never finished. I don't know, but there's no switches or anything in the uh, dashboard or on the turn signal stalk. So that's a little odd. I wonder what was going on with that. The other interesting thing is this homemade bug guard to protect the radiator. And you can see they actually use dowel rods to secure it um, it, it actually is kind of nice, and it is a good idea. This one actually really needs to be cleaned off because that's going to hurt the uh, airflow. But it's a good idea to have these guards because it will protect the radiator from rocks, keep bugs from getting all clogged in your radiator. Um, but it's kind of neat that somebody actually went through the trouble of making one that wasn't just like tied on with a bunch of string. Next, we're going to talk about the other cool feature of this car. And this is the other cool part. We got three pedals in here. That's because this car's equipped with a manual transmission. 
which is very seldom seen in 70s cars. This 72 Dodge Coronet actually has a couple safety features when it comes to starting a car and being able to drive it. I've not had a whole lot of 70s or later manual transmission vehicles. I've never had one that was three speed on the column. Uh, one thing I noticed is with the key out of the ignition, it actually locks the gear selector. Now, in order to get the key out, this has to be in reverse. So it locks it in reverse. So let me put the e-brake on so this thing will not roll away. In order to shift the gears or change the gear position, you have to put the key in. And as you can see, locked. Click it one time and now it's unlocked. You can shift through the gears, but you can't take the key out. So you have to be in reverse in order to turn the ignition switch off and remove the key. So that's the first safety feature, which I guess also prevents people from stealing your car because not only does the steering wheel lock, but so does the gear shift. Um, so there won't be no rolling this thing away without doing a couple things. <laughs> um, anyways, in order to start the car, it's already in reverse. So you'll have the key in the ignition. You'll push the clutch pedal all the way to the floor. It has to be all the way to the floor in order to start. You'll see if I don't push it to the floor, nothing. It won't start. Now, if I push the clutch pedal all the way to the floor, bingo. After that, you can shift it into gear. Now, this is a typical H pattern, so up and down, over and up and down. So, in the middle, the middle of the H is neutral. Back towards you and down is first. Back towards you and up is reverse. Now, second gear is forward and up. Third gear is forward and down. So, the middle is neutral, of course. So, we'll take a short drive around. You can see how it shifts and all. style that's just how it bought it
are pretty good. It's quite comfortable. The ride is actually quite nice. And it drives really smooth. with manual drum brakes and it stops the car pretty good for what it is a lot of people complain drum brakes are inadequate drum brakes suck yeah they're not as good as disc brakes of course but on these later cars especially in the 70s they got pretty big ones um, big shoe size so they do stop pretty good this car would lock up the tires and it can bring this car to stop pretty quick here we'll talk about the interior it looks to be mostly original you can see the carpet has some wear I'm not sure if the seat inserts are original maybe somebody could chime in they definitely look period the vinyl definitely is original the headrests are in excellent shape usually these things are all rotten this car is a custom trim level so it has the fancier wheel with the wood grain Headliner is in great shape. Some stains, probably from water leaking, or maybe our rodent friends, not sure. Door panels are in pretty good shape. And this is how you open the door from the inside. And of course, manual crank windows. Let's take a look at the instrumentation. This car is a very driver-centric vehicle. As you can see, all the controls, the radio, heater, all that is for the driver, recessed in. The passenger doesn't have a whole lot. We'll take a look at the left side of the dashboard. We got our heater and defroster. The heater and defroster was standard in 1972 for the Dodge Coronet. As you can see, we got heat there in the middle, defrost on the far right all from the left obviously then we have our temperature control low to high then we have a three speed blower we have the headlight switch on the far left one click is park lots two clicks is headlights we have our temperature gauge our gas gauge there is our low oil pressure warning light the speedometer of course and the odometer there underneath that Migrate into the right side of the dashboard. We got our alternator gauge. We have the clock delete. Um, if you had a clock, this is where it would go. And of course, over here is the brake warning lamp, which comes on when the emergency brake is 
applied. We do have a two-speed wiper and washer. You push it in to activate the washer and then it automatically clicks it to the slow wiper speed. And then we have our AM radio down here on the bottom right. On, off, and station selection. And there are pre-selects. Right here is a knob that you can pull out and that will turn on the emergency flashers. And of course, our ignition switch, which is locked without a key, and our gear shift, which is locked like I've talked about before. Another thing I noticed is a fastened seat belt light, perhaps? I don't know if it actually lights up. It looks like there could possibly be a bulb in there, perhaps. I'm kind of curious, actually, how that functions. Now, as far as the passenger side, they get a centrally located ashtray with lighter for driver and passenger. The floor vents pull out. Left side is driver's side, obviously. Right side is passenger side. And then you can see here, Cornet Custom. We have fancy wood grain and we have a glove box with the typical shallow cup holders, which are only good for drive-in movies or drive-in restaurants. And we do have some original literature in here. So there is the, there is the owner's manual. And somebody wrote on there, looks like April, fir, April 22nd, 1972, which might be when they took ownership of the vehicle since this car was built March 3rd, 1972. And the owner's manual, of course, shows everything you need to know about the car. Some more doodles on the back. Looks like directions and some math equations. This is supposed to be under the hood. It's the emission control information. You can see there, 225 cubic inch engine. Got a mission control systems booklet. An important message from your Chrysler man in Detroit. They care about us. Chrysler Corporation and your dealer cares. So we can write directly to the people. And that is from 8, 1971. And if you wanted a boat, Chrysler makes it happen, Captain. Kind of neat artwork. You can mail in for your new Chrysler fleet if you wanted a boat. It's always neat to see the original stuff. Also looks to be emblem. I wonder if that goes on the trunk lid. I bet you it does. This one does appear to be a lock-in glove box which might have been standard on the Coronet Custom. We do have a day-night mirror. And then we have our typical 1970s shoulder belt option here. The seat belts on this car and most early 70s cars is kind of interesting because it was kind of like an afterthought. The shoulder belts are a separate piece and are up here on the roof. So you actually have to take the shoulder belt down in order to use it. Uh, that's why most of the time they're never touched because people didn't want to waste their time doing that. You can't actually leave them hooked up, um, and I'll show you how this thing works. In order to put the shoulder belt on, um, there is on the lap belt a little clip right here. So I'll buckle this up just so it stays there. And then you would have to pull the shoulder belt down. You can loosen it up. And you can see that the buckle clips. And then you can tighten this up. And it does work, um, but it is like running right on your neck. Um, 
not the most comfortable thing. And as you can see, it kind of makes getting in and out of the back a little more troublesome for your passengers. Um, you can leave it hooked up, like I said. So if you wanted to always have a shoulder belt, you can leave it hooked up and it'll stay on there. It locks on. And the black belt will retract back down and it'll stay there. So then if you want to put it on, you just put it on like you would normally with the lap belt, pull it up and buckle. A lot of work and there's no real movement once you got this thing hooked on. So a lot of people just didn't use them. To release the seatbelt you probably already saw, you just push the button. And the lap belt will retract. And this thing, you kind of got to fish it in the loops here on the headliner. I'm really not sure how it's really supposed to go back on, but mm, something like this. It's kind of a pain in the butt. That's why you see them so <laughs> messed up. And then you gotta... This is why you can see nobody wanted to use these things, which is why they changed them later in the 70s to make them easier to use by being one piece. Uh, I believe in 71, they actually they had their own buckle. They, there was a whole bunch of buckles in the seat because this would have its own buckle that you have to clip on. I'm going to keep messing with this. And yeah, something like that, whatever. I'll make it tighter later, but as you can see, nobody wants to use those things. Down below, we have our emergency brake, push, pull to release. And then we have our high-low beam dimmer switch down there on the floorboard. For the rear passengers, we do have ashtrays on each armrest. Back seat is in good shape. A lot more room than a smaller compact car. And there are six seat belts in this vehicle. The front has two shoulder belts. The back, you could also get shoulder belts installed by your dealer. And I've never actually seen that on a car, so I don't know if anyone ever actually did that. Now let's talk about the outside of this car. First thing you can see is the front bumper. It encircles the entire grill, so it prevents the grill, which is plastic, from getting damaged. Uh, this started in 1970 and went up to 1973 with this full encircling bumper. 1974, he went back to a traditional lower bumper. Um, that's just one of the features that was what they marketed as standard on this car. The other thing is what most Mopar people will find very familiar is this side marker lot. It's actually the first year for this one. Before that, they were flush with the body. They used this side marker lot all the way up into the 90s. I had a 92 Dodge truck, same marker lot. Even the mold still says 1972 on it. And when you turn the lots on, they light up. There's an amber one in the front and a red one in the back. We can see here, there's this piece of trim. This is one of the things that differentiates the Coronet Custom. You can see here, we got custom underneath there from the standard coronet. This full length trim down the side, the stainless around the roof drip rail. And this car would have originally had stainless around the wheel openings, um, but those got removed at some point. This car does have the standard dog dish hubcaps, which I prefer. We do got a standard side mirror. They talked about the door pull handle as being a feature. And another thing that everyone was crazy about in the 70s was the hidden wipers. I'm really not sure why that was such a big deal, but when the wipers are off, they go under the hood. Everyone's crazy about that. I don't, I don't know why that was so cool to people in the 70s, but most of the cars had hidden wipers. This body basically was used from 71 to 78. Those later Dodge Monaco's same body. You can really easily tell by the door handles and the doors. The front and rears are a little bit different, but the main structure is the same. So they use this body quite a ways. This trim does circle 
all the way around and around the back of the trunk lid. Like I said, that differentiates the Coronet Custom. I believe there would have been a Dodge emblem here, maybe that one that's in the glove box. And you can see we got four tail lights. The middle is a reverse lot. And down here is our gas fill. That's how you fill up. Gas tanks in the middle makes it easy for going on either side of the pump. I guess while we're back here, we'll take a look inside the trunk. Pretty spacious trunk. The trunk floor is in pretty good shape, actually. It don't look like there's any rust. The bumper jack is back there. Right here is the stud that the tire is actually supposed to mount on. I guess someone lost the wing nut, so it's just laying in here. Um, no rot, that's always a good thing. And then, oh, used to have a trailer hitch, it looks like, because there's a plug for one. But it looks like they've removed it, which is kind of a bummer, because I like having hitches. We do have jack instructions here on how to use it and how to stow it when not in use. And then you can see the original paint and some factory chalk marks and whatnot. Not a whole lot going on under here. It's just a trunk. There's supposed to be a rubber mat in here, but somebody must have tore it out at some point. Um, there's plenty of space though, and it's in really good shape. Our side trim, once again, going down the side, our red marker light on the back. I want to say that was maybe mandated by the government. Obviously this side is just like the other side, other than we got our antenna for our radio. Coronet Custom Emblems. And then we're back to the front. The car's in really good shape, especially being from up in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Usually those cars are just all rotted out. Somehow this one survived. It's in really good shape overall, and it drives really nice, so I can't complain too much. You're probably wondering, how long is this car? That's like a common question. Everyone asks about an old car. This car is a little over 17 feet, like 17.25 feet from end to end. So it's pretty big, um, but it's not like the largest car ever. And this is the B body, so it's your intermediate model. You had the A body, which was the Dodge Dart, this car, which is a B-body, Dodge Coronet. Then you had the C-body, which is the largest, which was your Dodge Polara. This car is interesting because it's a Coronet Custom, so it's the higher trim line, but it really doesn't have a whole lot of options. Like I said, it's a slant six, it's a stick shift, dogdish hubcaps, but other than that, it's got power steering, it's got a radio, and that's the gist of it, pretty much. You know, a lot of these cars in this kind of configuration would have been a fleet car or a government car, but I think someone ordered this car this way, mainly because it's the upper trim level and, you know, it doesn't have any indications with the VIN number that was a police package or fleet vehicle or anything like that. The color, GY9, Dodge called dark gold metallic. It's kind of a green, brown, gold, 70s color. You might even call it like puke green or something that people like to call it. I like it. It's not necessarily everyone's favorite color, but it's very 70s and very appropriate. This car kind of screams like Dirty Harry, 1970s police movie or something like that, especially with the dogdish hubcaps. This car, like I said, doesn't have a whole lot of options, but there were a plethora of options. Anything from a in-the-floor mounted cassette player to a 400 big block with a four-speed on the floor and everything in between. So this car doesn't have a lot of options, um, but it's cool in the fact that it's a cheapo model that still survives, that doesn't have a lot of options, because frankly, most of those got used up, abused. They were fleet vehicles or police vehicles and went to auction and just got destroyed under the new ownership. So it's very rare to find one of these that has been monkeyed with, that's in this good of shape, that still retains its original drivetrain, uh, which is this six cylinder with a manual transmission. It's just not very common. So that's one reason why I had to have it, just because it's so oddball, and I like oddball cars. Thanks for tuning in to Obsolete Automotive. Hope you enjoyed this walk around video of the 72 Dodge Coronet Custom. My name is Alston. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe down below. It really helps the channel. And also check out our Instagram, at Obsolete Automotive. Until next time, what's under the hood? So, oh wait, actually there's no hood release on this car. It's, okay.
There really are nuts in the hood. There definitely are freaking, look, look on the. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a cat in the.